Hello, I'm Pam Sidhu, a mindfulness coach. I'm here at Punjab 2000 today. I'm really honoured to be um, with a very special guest today. As you know, Punjab 2000, we're not just covering the music and the movies. We love to do that. But we also like to look at topics and important things that affect all of us um, currently in society. So doing that, here with me today is a Poppy Jaman OBE. Hi, Poppy. Hello, Pam. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, thank you, and all the better for seeing you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today, because we're going to speak about a very important topic um, that can get missed in our communities. Unfortunately, you know, it can get swept to the side, but we're bringing it out in the open today. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're going to we're going to really take the lid off this one and uh, talk about it. So. On Saturday, the 10th of October, it was World Mental Health Day. And what we're talking about today is mental health. Now, Poppy, I know, of course, you've worked in mental health, but not only have you worked in mental health, you have paved the way for making that difference. So for those of you at home at the moment, just to give you a little bit of background about Poppy. So this is Poppy Jaman OBE. She's the global ambassador for mental health. She's the CEO of City Mental Health Alliance, which is all about changing how we view mental health in the workplace and making it a mentally healthy place to work. And this is a global initiative. And many of you will have heard of um, Mental Health at First Aid England. Well, Poppy is the lady responsible for building that and getting it out there. And just to you know, let you know how much of a difference that made, Back in 2018, there was 1,800 instructors that had, had trained over 300,000 mental health first aiders at work. So first of all, Poppy, I'd like to say thank you to you for the amazing work that you have done and that you are doing in mental health. Thanks, Pam. And, uh, you know, none of this can be done without community and people. One person doesn't make the difference, which is why we're here, aren't we? Um, so I get to have all the um, uh, thank yous and congratulations for people all over our country and the world, in fact, that have been leading on mental health. So chuffed to bits to take that. <laughs> well, thank you, you know, um, like I said, for taking the time out today. Now, you know what, let's just take it back to basics for people for a moment. You know, what is mental health? You know, how would you define mental health? Yeah, and so look, when we say mental health, Pam, particularly if you haven't uh, spent time getting educated on it, we automatically think about mental illness. And that's actually not true. Mental health is something that all of us have got. Um, just like we've got physical health. So if I said to you, have you got physical health? You would say, well, actually, yeah, I have. But these are some of the things that are not right at the moment. And that's exactly the same for mental health. You know, we've all got mental health and sometimes things happen in life. Life happens to us. Um, multiple stresses build up and we can become unwell and that's mental illness. And I guess why that's important to make as a point right from the outset is just like we look after our physical health, uh, we can look after our mental health. So in the same way that we, if we eat healthy, we, we exercise, we, we look after our bodies, we can actually foster human flourishing and mental well-being, which you'll know all about because you're a mindful ex mindfulness expert and you do this stuff. And I've worked with you on this anyway before. Last October, in fact, we were working together. Right, on yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so we can, we can foster healthy relationships, which is good for our mental health. We can build connections like you and I are trying to do here today. That's good for our mental health. We can give. And when we give, it creates a helper's high, which means the person receiving um, gets something out of it. The person giving gets something out of it. We can keep learning. That is good for our mental well-being because it keeps us engaged. Um, so I think, and, and we can obviously physical exercise, physical health, getting up, moving, all of those things are good for our mental health. So 
that's one of the myths that I really want to bust is that we all have mental health. That isn't a negative word. That isn't a negative term. That's actually a real positive thing. Um, and sometimes if we don't continue to take care of ourselves, we, we can become unwell. And in the current climate, Pam, that is more important than ever before. The pandemic has shown up so many issues including you know the new patterns of working small businesses are affected in a big way which is a big deal for our communities i'm from the bangladeshi community um you know most of our communities run on small businesses and actually that financial health being impacted means that we're worrying more obviously the pandemic has had this disproportionate impact in the uk on some of our communities more than others and that's partly because we live in multi-generational households, so um, social distance is, is difficult, so that puts us at more risk, which means that we will be affected by loss and grief. Now, if you take just take those few things that I've just said, we're worrying about our children, we're caring for our elders, we're running um, businesses or doing jobs that may feel very insecure or different at the moment, and then on top of that, if we put grief and loss in place, you can understand why we're at, at risk at the moment of becoming unwell. And that's why this conversation today is so important to me, is because if we can all do little things to look after our mental health, teach our kids, look, uh, teach our elders on mental well-being, we are going to fare much, much better on the journey that's coming up. Um, and it's not a new thing, it's always been around, but I think the pandemic has exacerbated the need for this conversation. Absolutely, and you know, um, the phrase that's coming to my mind at the moment is prevention is better than cure. Yeah. You know, we, we know how to look after, as you said, we know how to look after our physical bodies, but mental health, I don't know about you Poppy, but growing up, no one spoke to me about mental health. Um, no one said to me, that, you know, this can happen, this can be how you feel. I didn't see it happening around me in the communities until I was older. And then it was just almost seen as a sign of weakness, you know? Um, and there was um, a definite um, label of shame attached to it. So, you know, in, in, in Punjabi, there's a phrase, which is, um, and I'll just say this and then I'll translate, which is, um, which is, you know, if something's happening in your house, if you're, if you're feeling, you know, um, unwell, if there is mental health, you're not supposed to go out and talk about it. You're not supposed to tell people about it. So, you know, we are dealing with a bit of a double whammy, really, because um, not only is it, is it, what it is in terms of wider society, but in our communities, um, it seems to be a lot more, and there's a lot more work to be done, which is why we're having this conversation and taking the veil off it and, you know, exposing it for what it is. Yeah. How is it for you, Poppy? Yeah, look, I think like one of the things that I wish, if, if, I, had a, if I had a magic wand, and I could change one thing, I would take, I would delete shame from mental health and mental ill health. And I think shame is, a, it comes as a result of the stigma, it comes as a result of the fact that you've just said, you know, you know, we perceive mental ill health as a weakness. Um, we, um, there's also all the other cultural um, issues. So for example, you know, we still operate, operate very much in the introdu introduction marriage, the arranged marriage system. So you get into a conversation, well, you know, if my daughter's unwell or if my son's unwell, we can't let anybody know about that because that's going to become a blot on our family that is seen as negative. So there's that bit. But then there's the wider society issues for workplaces, for example, you know, which is where most of my work is at the moment, is if you're in a job and you are de developing anxiety, depression, um, having experiences that are challenging, you don't want to talk about it because if there's a perception that, that it's a weakness, then, then, you know, you might lose your job, for example. But I take that one step further. It, I think self-stigma 
is a really big deal in all of this. So when we judge ourselves up against whatever is supposed to be perfect or normal or success, you know, mental health issues do not feature in that. Um, we're almost sort of wanting to put this persona together of perfectionism and that just doesn't exist because it's not human to be perfect. And, but we are very, very, very tough on ourselves. And so self stigma, I think is the other thing that really is the crux of where the shame comes from. And I suppose on that, well, you know, I really reflected on this and thought, well, how do we get rid of the shame? How do we get rid of the stigma? And the, and the only way I think we can do that is by telling our own stories because until all of us Pam, feel comfortable to say, do you know what, I'm not having a great day or I'm not having a great month because of these things and this is how I feel and feel, and, and, and feel completely comfortable that we're not gonna be judged, we're not gonna be dismissed we're not going to be seen as less than, then that then nothing changes. Um, and maybe I suppose on that on that Pam, I can I can lead by example by sharing my story if that's okay. Please with do you. yes, please do. I think it's so valuable, as you said, to be sharing our stories. And um, uh, I know that you recently have started a blog where you're sharing your story for this for this awareness, you know, to raise awareness. So thank you, uh, Poppy, it would be great um, to share with everybody your story. Yeah, absolutely. So my recent blog, which maybe we can attach to this post, um, I, you know, for anybody that might find it helpful to, to, uh, to, to read, but it, it and, and the, re the way that I wrote the blog was, uh, I called it the green sari for mental health. So Pam, as you will know, I have an infatuation with saris. <laughs> and, um, and I thought to myself, how can I bring the love of uh, my saris, my love of saris and my experiences of poor mental health in one place? And actually, if I do that, will I resonate with other South Asian women? And in fact, I did. So on World Mental Health Day, I can't remember how many, but I, it was hundreds of people in on Instagram, on Twitter, and then in a Facebook page that I'm I'm a part of called Sari Speak. There was there was again thousands of people, women primarily, that engaged with it. And I guess that's what I'm trying to achieve. Having worked in this space for as long as I have, I feel like I now need to influence and change and help bring this to South Asian communities and people that look like you and I. Um, yeah so that we can relate to 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 it and 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 have some fun while we're doing it so so green sari for mental health or green for mental health a lot of my Punjabi friends were turned up in some of the pieces <laughs> they were like we haven't got a sari collection but we've got this beautiful suit <laughs> um and I think that's also important because there is beauty in in mental health and well-being you know if we're that bring, that's that's the whole person isn't it so in my 20s, Pam, I, um, like you, had no idea what, I'd, I'd never heard of the term mental health. I'd never really engaged with mental illness because it, that was It just wasn't there, was it? Yeah. No, it really wasn't. Um, and so, you know, I grew up in um, Portsmouth, which is a, um, a, a city down here in the south. And actually growing up in the 80s was really tough for us because we experienced, you know, racism, sexism, yeah. all of those things were just accepted, really. So I guess that was part of my upbringing, which many people here would be able to relate to being the only brown girl in the school, mm -hmm. only one that was different. Mum was sending me into school with olive oil in my hair, which didn't really help. Gave me really great hair, but didn't really <laughs> <Yeah>. help <laughs> fitting in. Um, I, you know, I was the first person in my school with a nose stud and it wasn't a punk gesture. It was a, that was my mm. culture. So I, again, lots of little things and big things. Yeah. I remember my school teacher saying, you know, you've got leggings on instead of a PE skirt. Can you step out of the school photograph because this is going to be used for a brochure. That doesn't foster a sense of belonging in a teenager. So that was sort of bits of the upbringing. Of course, I had 
lots of amazing uh, experiences as well, but just wanted to pull out some of the mm. things that happened to us. And then I, I had my first child, um, my daughter, and actually that triggered, um, that was probably the last straw in all of the experiences up growing up here in the UK as a British Asian woman. Um, and that resulted in a diagnosis of postnatal depression. You know, I just felt really numb. I remember just thinking, I, you know, why am I not feeling this swell of love for this child? And I was doing all the right things physically, but inside I was really numb. And I kept thinking, you know, the world would be a better place without me. And I don't think I can parent this young, young life that I'm responsible for. And at the time I was in a marriage that I was very unhappy in so was there was just it was just really challenging time so the mental health issues developed further I started to um, have suicidal ideations um, I then tried to end my pain a couple of times um, and that then led to getting therapy getting medication and actually it wasn't me that advocated for seeking help because I didn't know that I could get help because I didn't know there was anything wrong with me I just thought I was wrong you know yeah. I yeah. didn't know because I had no idea what was going on and I was you know in early 20s and again for many South Asian women of my age that will resonate because many of us got married very young 17 18 yeah. Um, many of us got married in countries, you know, so I went back to Bangladesh to get married. I, I have Sikh friends um, who went back to yeah. India to get married. So there was cultural differences. There was language barriers, you know, all of those things that, you know, and that responsibility for being the eldest daughter in law, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. And in an already, um, it you know, adding, like you're saying, adding to an, an, an already existing almost identity crisis, you know, that's going on because we didn't fit here, but we didn't fit over there. And, you know, and then on top of that, like you're saying, getting married young to a man from another country, another culture, because even though our families told us we are from there, we didn't quite fit, did we? Because we're British Asians and so, you know, um, and there's so many women, Hoppy, um, I'm so pleased that you're sharing this because there's so many women in past and present that experience what you experienced after having a child. Yeah. You know, it, it's not um, it's not always um, where you instantly feel love for this child and instantly become this amazing mother. Um, I mean, I know now I, 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 you know, I know you are now an absolutely amazing mother. But what you experienced was a real condition. Yeah, um, and, it, and it was a health issue. And it was, it was, you know, and you can completely recover from it. I think that's the other thing about the stigma is because we're not educated enough in this whole subject and because the stigma exists in society, whichever country you go in into the world, yeah. Um, there is al almost this thought that you will never recover. And for the fear of that, we don't seek help, but actually by not seeking help early, you're prolonging your recovery journey. Cause it's like anything, isn't it? Diabetes, that's a very common health issue in our, in our communities. Our love for sugar yes. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and sweets is just up there. So, but, but again, if you leave it and leave it and leave it, actually you're gonna get into a crisis point. Whereas if you address it early, put in some prevention strategies, maybe not eat, you know sweets every day <laughs> you know there's things that we can do and it's exactly the same with mental health issues is recognizing that it is an illness recovery is possible and we can do a number of different things to support ourselves and each other makes a huge difference and I think for me going back to that point in life because I didn't know what was going on with me it was my my Chinese health visitor who was, and I think her name was Alice, and I can't remember, I was thinking about this in preparing sort of for this, but she was the one that went, look, you know, you're going through, you've got, you've got postnatal depression, this numb feeling, this is what it means, these are the things that you can expect, 
and this is how you're going to recover and we're going to put in meditation and I was like I mean you Pam you will laugh at this because I know you are like an expert but I was like why am I sitting still in this <laughs> zen like like I didn't get it but I completely get it now and so she helped introduce meditation to me she um etc and then I guess at the time my best friend who was also a Bangladeshi woman and she and I both had babies together um, at the same time so we were both going through similar experiences but that support that peer support going god do you feel this yes I feel that Mm. to be able to relate to each other was so important so I'm so glad that I had a health professional that was looking out for me and who knew and I think because she was also Chinese it really helped with that cultural difference understanding she knew that from her own cultural background that in my community it was probably as difficult and also there was Mm. no literature in Chinese at the time there was no literature in Bengali at the time not that I speak um, or read or write Bengali but it would have been helpful for my family yes to understand what was going on so that they were a bit because I guess what what my family's reaction to it was um, getting spiritual help and again Mm. I think spirituality has this really clear place in all of this and in the western culture we talk less about that but for our communities faith and spirituality is going to form very much part of our recovery journey Mm. so so having peer support from a mate having health professional that noticed and did something about it and then having a lean in to faith and spirituality to actually hold me during that period was essential. And I think I'll just say one more thing. And then the other thing that was really important for me was identity. So you you touched on that, you know, our identities as British Asians um, of our generation, I think it's different for our children, um, but for our generation was a bit, messy because uh, we, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, I don't think there's a, there's a better word to describe it really other than it was a bit messy yeah you know um yeah and I think you know like so I listen to my aunts and mums talking mum mum and aunties talk about their upbringing in Bangladesh for example and they've got this real strong clarity about who they were as women what family they belong to what village they belong to and then here I was thinking well no, I'm not really sure I fully belong mm. in, in, in that, but I also don't belong here. So where do I belong? And yes. it is amongst my peers. It's about, it's amongst my fear of friends. It's, it's in my family. And I, I spent a lot of time in my early twenties looking for belonging. And actually mm. in my thirties and forties through a lot of therapy and coaching mm. discovered that it was with my people, my friends, yes. people loved me it wasn't a place that I was trying to find Mm -hmm. um but work was the other place that I found belonging Pam so I you know the therapy I said that you know in the early days I was referred to therapy but the therapy was not culturally appropriate so the woman I I still remember her I I sort of remember saying to her like so I've, I've I've had um an arranged marriage and this is the dynamics here and I've got mother-in-law and you know and father-in-law and 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 she just looked perplexed she was a bit like why I don't understand so I spent more time in that early therapy sessions or two or three that I went to um sort of educating her on my culture and actually wasn't getting enough out of it so I stopped therapy and got a job and that yeah. job gave me purpose. It gave me a different identity to the one that I had probably labeled myself with. It gave me financial health. And as women, I think that's really important that we have financial health and independence so that we have, can make choices. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, so, so work, my workplace at the time, even though they didn't know necessarily what was going on with me in my personal world, became a very important part of my recovery journey, in addition to sort of the peer support, the health professional, the, the, the soul searching in, co- in coaching and, and therapy afterwards. Work is a really important part of, part mm-hmm. of that. And I think that's why 
workplaces, whether it's small businesses, whether it's large corporations, need to create a place where we can bring our whole selves to, to, to that. And our communities need to do that as well, whether it's gurdwaras or masjids, you know, they need to be places where we can come and be all of us ourselves without having without leaving bits of our identity as we take off our shoes at the doors and leave them there as we enter these places because because that's where we're going to get the healing and that's mm. where we need to create communities that are healthy yes and there is more and more active work that's being done there you know as you've mentioned in the good dollars and the masjids and you know at you know there's a lot of projects at the moment that are out there working on a grassroots level so that it's becoming it's a very different world to when we grew up where mental health wasn't talked about I as well never heard the expression of mental health like yourself like yourself you know it's a very different world and for our children we are now creating a different world to where we grew up mm-hmm. um, so not only did you throw yourself into work and found that to be really beneficial for your well-being because you found a purpose you know you found you found this purpose and your purpose has made the made a difference to countless people um, in terms of this mental health first first aid there was you know we all knew about first aid in terms of physical but yes there's a mental health first aid as well mental health first aid at work and you're continuing I mean I was looking at some of your stuff the other day and you're being contacted by global ambassadors from around the world you know um, from key people around the world because what you're doing here in Britain in terms of leading the way for mental health awareness other people like I know in America and people people are picking that up and saying hang on you know what you've created such a good model there can you know can we can we take that on? So this is like, it, it's kind of like, you know, when you, you throw a, a stone into a pond and you get this ripple effect going outwards that can just go outwards and help people. But for, for normal people dealing with normal situations, you know, um, you know, we've talked about, you know, uh, your story, which is very important. And thank you for sharing that, um, you know, I myself, before I got into mindfulness, um, experienced anxiety, which is what led me into that. Um, You know, everybody has their own story. Most people at some point in their life have experienced um, mental health. But now in, in the middle of this pandemic, you know, no matter what country we're sat in right now as people are watching this, this pandemic is affecting us and it is affecting people's mental health as well in terms of, you know, loss of income, like you mentioned, bereavement, you know, every system and structure that we knew in society has changed in 2020 due to the pandemic and the way we operate. Social isolation is on the up. You know, you you mentioned there about our elders, you know, my parents, for example, they're shielding. So I can't see them how I saw them before. You know, they don't have that contact with their grandkids. You know, they're having to do more and more thank, to, to look after themselves, to look after their mental health. And thank God for, you know, video calling. But it's not the same as mm-hmm. sitting together and giving each other a hug. And, you know, there's there's so many elders that I can think of that are isolated right now. Um, and even, um, you know, people that are living in a multi-generational household. You know, I live in a multi-generational household with my in-laws and my kids. And we're always, you know, constantly thinking, okay, the kids are back at school. How are we protecting mom and dad? Yeah. You know, what are we doing? But then there's the whole, that's physically protecting them. There's the whole mental health side. You know, I've touched on a few issues there. Myself, I had COVID in in June. Luckily, I didn't have it really bad. You know, I had it like the flu, but I self-isolated in my room for three weeks and I had to stay in my room for three weeks. And of course, I know the mindfulness, I know lots of NLP. I, you know, applied all those techniques. And even though I was applying all these techniques and even though I knew all of this, I feel that I had to put a lot of effort in to keep myself mentally right, 
you know, because it's just so easy to tip, um, yeah. you know, the other way. Yeah. So what is what what would you like to to share on what people are going through now and what help is available now? Pam, thanks for sharing that. And just going through walking through your three weeks or your four months, actually, um, in the way that you have is exactly what we need to um home in on because and actually because you've got a practice that keeps you mentally well so you're you meditate and that is really good for you so that builds your resilience it keeps you topped up we all need to discover what our mental well-being toolkit is and the 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 thing uh, there's one well one way that i've discovered and i teach people to do that is it's, it's not very particularly scientific and it's not particularly, uh, you know, clever. It's really easy. And I say to people, just grab a bit of paper and on one side, write down your stress, write the title stress signature. And on the other side, write the title wellbeing toolkit. And on your stress signature side, just jot down and build this over over two three weeks you know and change it as as you as things change for you because our bodies change our minds change we change but on the stress signature bit write down things that you feel when you are stressed so for me physical is jaw clenching so I get migraines because I've been <laughs> I've been holding myself in a certain way I get neck and back pains so those are two very physical, clear things. In terms of emotions, I get quite irritable. So, you know, little things, you know, you know that wouldn't normally bother me. Suddenly I start to be like internal ranting about the kids leaving the dishes out and blah, 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 blah. Things that don't actually matter suddenly become issue, an issue. So irritability. Um, in terms of behavior, micromanaging. So, you know, I start to send emails, like four emails about the same thing to my team, which is not fun for them. Um, but noticing that I'm, you know, anxious that I don't trust that things are going to get done. So I'm now doubling up. And that's not helpful for me because then I'm doing emails till quite late. Um, and then and then also. So um, sort of distorted thinking is the other thing that happens to me in terms of cognition. So I start to have a voice in my head and I and I don't hear voices. I know many people hear voices, um, which and I have heard voices when I've been really unwell. Um, but that's a presentation of mental ill health. But I start to get this narrative in my, you're not good enough. You should have done this. You could have done this. You So there's this negative narrative that develops. So these are sort of four or five things that go on my stress signature. And, as, and if you notice, I've talked about physical uh, presentation, early warning signs, emotional, behavioral, and cognition. So those are all sort of four, how I think, how I feel, how I behave, and what's happening in my body. Mm -hmm. And I lose motivation. So I like to practice yoga every single day, even if it's just 10 minutes, but actually that goes out the window. So on the flip side, I, on my wellbeing toolkit, I write down all the things that make me happy and try and write this on a day that you're having a good day. So everything from Earl Grey tea, which is like all time favorite, or going to a Bangladeshi cafe and getting chai really sweet in a glass. Like that is, mm. like that, there is nothing good. <laughs> Just that warmth of like sweet tea in a glass, like that is home to me. Um, my mum's food. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. So like nothing can beat that. So on my well-being toolkit, I write down things that make me happy and lift me. Mm. And when I notice that there's two or three things on my stress signature or my early warning signs are in play, I flip the page and do one thing from the well-being toolkit. And I kid you not, it works every time because one of the things that happens when we're experiencing multiple stresses, we lose the ability to make decisions quickly. We have brain fuzz and actually creating this, this personal tool for you means that it takes that process out of it. You just go, right, this is what I'm doing because I already know. The other thing I would say is everybody should go and check out the platform, Every Mind Matters. 
Um, it's a platform that was developed by Public Health England, NHS, um, NHS England together. Some two years ago, I presented the proposal for Every Mind Matters platform to Theresa May's government. And I'm just, I'm so happy with this platform. And it's been, it's been adjusted several times so that actually it's speaking more and more to communities all over our country. But it's, it's somewhere where you can go, you answer five questions and it gives you your mind plan. And it very much sits on the wellness, prevention, creating health, mentally healthy um, lifestyles. If you're in crisis, it will also point you into the right NHS services. And I think knowing about these platforms and getting involved in them um, for ourselves, and also if they're not a good cultural fit, write in and tell PHE, like there's a, you know, information link there about what else you want on there, because we have to take responsibility to shape and build the mental health systems and the care systems and the support systems that we want and need, because this is our country. We are British Asians. We do belong here and we have a right to be expected. We, ex we should expect to be heard. So and we should expect from ourselves to be radical and relentless in our efforts to create healthier lives for ourselves and our families by getting involved in this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I think it's a really important point that you've highlighted there where this is our country and we should be giving feedback in there and that's a great resource that you've highlighted there every mind matters and once again Poppy thank you for helping to bring that about you know so that uh, I, I'm just sat here right now I'm in absolute awe of how much you have done to actually bring mental health to the forefront here in the country. And this is one of the reasons why I really wanted this interview to happen because you're one of ours. You know, um, we have, we've, we've, we've gone through, uh, as well as countless people that are watching this right now, gone through similar experiences and you've, you've owned it to the point where you're, you know, you're able to make that difference now. And you mentioned as well, when you were telling your story, that you tried to end your emotional pain twice. I mean, I'm, as well as countless others, are so happy that you were not successful there, you know, because otherwise we wouldn't have mental health first aid, aid at work. We wouldn't have Every Mind Matters. You know, you're a global ambassador for mental health, inspiring many. And, you know, unfortunately, it seems to be on the up where more and more people young people are you know attempting suicide so you know for that you know if anybody if any of the young people are watching now you would recommend go on every mind matters get the help what would you like to say to them poppy do you know um every 40 seconds someone somewhere in the world is dying by suicide and and that literally breaks my heart because because so many lives can be saved by us talking, getting educated, listening with our hearts, leading by example, being more open about our well-being toolkit. This isn't just about the mental illness lived experience. This is also about me and you going, hey guys, this works for us and this is works for me and, I, and this is what I'm doing to look after my mental health. So that actually we start changing the narrative about it. And I think as a mother, of four kids, young people, they're not kids anymore. <laughs> I, you know, one of my, our children's, somebody in, in one of our children's friendship group died by suicide just two, just over two weeks ago. And it, I can't even begin to imagine what is going through the hearts of that family, you know, that person's mom, dad. And I, I guess my my commitment is that I'll never try and I'll never try and forget either. I yeah. never I can't imagine it. I will never forget the call that my daughter made to me and told me about this and her voice. And I will never try and forget. And I guess 
if, if we look at the statistics, every single one of us will know someone that has struggled with their mental health issues, even if it's not ourselves. And what I say is let's not ignore those. Let's really, let's sit with empathy and then let's move to compassion. And the difference mm -hmm. between empathy and compassion is taking action. So yeah. I can feel your pain and I can just sit with you and listen to you. That is enough taking action. Mm -hmm. You know, but I can also live, live, be be a, a leader and go, OK, this is how I look after my mental health and I can advocate for it. I can get educated on it and I can signpost my friends and families to the right, right place by noticing. And in order to notice, we need to be able to have the how are you conversation and not just a, hey, how are you? Like, a, how are you really? How are you really? You know, Pam, I've, mm -hmm. I've known you for years. I'm noticing that you've not been on social media. You've not. So this is just an example of a conversation that I yeah. might have with you. I've no, noticed that your behavior has changed. So mm -hmm. you've not been active on social media. We, you've not returned my text messages. You've not engaged with some of the telephone calls and things that we've had. And I'm wondering what's going on for you, what's happening in your world. Yeah, and yeah. knowing that if you then went, actually, do you know what, Poppy, I'm really struggling. And, in f and then to be able to then go, so how, what does struggle look like? And then to be able to go, Pam, you know, are you, are you having thoughts that you might, the world might be a better place without you? People often think that we can't ask the suicide question because it will give people ideas. That is a myth. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can ask questions with, compassion and curiosity and create a safe place for you to be able to go do you know what I have had that thought and then to be able to say that's a really common thought and what that is a strong indicator is that you're really stressed and you might be becoming unwell and have you thought about the Every Mind Matters platform let's look at that together how about giving your GP a call so that is a mental health first aid conversation that I've described to you in very simple terms. And that's what that course does is it teaches you over two days. I think they've got, I mean, I obviously left the organization a couple of years ago, but they've got half a day, they've got one day, they've got two yeah. days. And I think we all need to become educated in that. The other organization that I would talk point to is Zero Suicide Alliance. That has been I think they've got a 20 minute online um, training course that I've completed myself. It's very similar to the conversation that I've just uh, shared with you. Go and complete that and, and at the very least feel confident that you would be able to have a how are you conversation with meaning. Yes, yes. Um, and it's so important to be able to do that, especially in today's times because whereas before we may have seen our colleagues in the workplace we may have seen our friends and families now we're not seeing them as much you know for people that are working from home isolation's going up check in check in with people you know um it's a phone call we've got video calling you know see see them you know even if you're not seeing them face to face do see them so um you know on that note um you know Poppy, thank you so much for taking the time um, to speak to us today. Um, I know that you're very passionate um, for making a difference on all levels. You know, you, you've made a difference on policy levels, on global levels. This is bringing it back to our communities. You would, you've been doing, you know, the, the Green Sari campaign. Um, I thought that was just absolutely fantastic. Green Sari for Mental Health. Um, you know, please do follow Poppy as well um, she's quite active on Insta I know you've been doing a number of um, blogs and um, you've been interviewing women as well I know you, you've done a series of interviews about mental health with with women from our community so um, thank you for taking the time to speak to us today Poppy. Um, thank you so much and I really you know everybody that's watching listening you know just self-care really important we can't drink out of an empty cup and doing whatever you can don't see self-care as an indulgence see, see self-care as a crucial part of staying well so that we can look after you know our families elders and youngers because actually we are the sandwich generation and 
we need to be as healthy as we possibly can. And just a final note, Pam, the, the best compliment, um, you've said some very lovely things about me. And, and, and like I said, it's, 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 it takes a lot of people to, to create the kind of work that we're doing. But the best compliment you've given me today is um, you're one of us. So going back to the belonging piece, you know, 20 something years on, I'm really beginning to feel my belonging. And actually, that is great for our all of our mental health. So thank you very much for that. No, thank you for being one of us. You know, um, I'm sure lots of people at home as well can relate to you, can relate to your story. Um, so thank you for being the one who's um, put it out there. And thank you for all the great tips that you've given and the signposting today as well. So you will continue to see me here at Punjab 2000. I'll be bringing you more issues, um, more important issues that need to be discussed in our society. But um, please do, you know, follow Poppy and also uh, we'll be putting links to her blog and also Every Mind Matters website here in the comments. So thank you, Poppy. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.